Hello friends, if you're new to my channel, welcome. How about going down and hitting the subscribe button and ringing the bell so you don't miss any episodes. For my fans and subscribers, welcome back. Thank you very much for the patronage. Today's topic, Jim Jones and the racial divide. I'm going to have to go through some background on race in America. Let's go! If you think racism is bad in America today, you're right. But it doesn't hold a candle to 1950s America. I wasn't alive back then, so I have to trust the history books. Lynchings and cross burnings were all too real. Then the Supreme Court ruling in Brown v. Board of Education ratcheted up the turmoil even more. The Brown v. Board of Education decision overturned the ruling of separate but equal, which had been established in 1896 in Plessy v. Ferguson. Of course, this outraged the racists, leading to even more civil unrest. On December 1, 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white person on a city bus and was arrested. Thus, the Montgomery bus boycott began. In 1956, the city desegregated its bus system. This propelled civil rights activist Martin Luther King Jr. to the fore. All across the nation, but especially in the Deep South, Civil rights marches took place, often ending in violence. Communities refused to comply with the court decision of Brown v. Board of Education, daring the federal government to do something, which of course it did. In 1957, President Eisenhower ordered the National Guard to enforce the Brown decision by protecting black school children enrolled at Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. However, nothing changed in Indianapolis. Why was this the case? If African Americans had lived in other neighborhoods, they could have gone to their neighborhood schools. The city ordinances that were still legally in place prevented blacks from living anywhere else, and so they were still segregated. City businesses were also segregated, and no one marched in protest. Even though city leaders kept agreeing to meet with black ministers, nothing really changed unless Jim Jones got involved. Official, officials kept promises made at People's Temple. Because they knew he would fight for them, he gained the loyalty of Black Temple members. Many of them now called him Father Jones and never doubted that he was on their side against the oppressors and he made their lives better in very real and tangible ways. However, since many Laurel Street Tabernacle members had joined, plus Jones's skill at winning converts on the revival circuit, the People's Temple Congregation had more whites and most were not committed to socialism or integration, but had been drawn by Jim's quote-unquote healings and preaching. Most of these new converts were working class white people opposed to the civil rights movement. So until Jim could win them over to the cause, he had to continue his pulpit showmanship. Nonetheless, some converts, like the Beans, did genuinely embrace the movement. With this in mind, he began with things that everyone could agree on, such as Satan being present and wanting to undo good works. 
Thus, Satan became the common enemy which united people's temple. Defying Satan, said Jones, meant accepting everyone as family despite differences. He would also organize activities for the congregation, such as picnics, talent shows, and trips to the zoo. Of course, everyone was welcome in his home. The Joneses lived modestly. Their furniture consisted of things that the Baldwins had given them and things picked up at yard sales. The dining room table was huge, mainly because Jim would invite anyone he had encountered that day home for a meal. Jim's mother, Lynetta, moved from Richmond to Indianapolis around 1957. She didn't want to miss out seeing for herself the kind of man Jim turned out to be. She moved in with her son and daughter-in-law and found a job guard at a women's prison to help with expenses. Agnes, the Joneses' adopted daughter, did not turn out to be the ideal child for the Joneses. She did overcome her stuttering, but nothing could change her personality. The Joneses never even entertained the thought of giving Agnes up. Instead, they decided to adopt more children. Jim accepted Marceline's proposal of a quote-unquote rainbow family. What better way to show a commitment to racial integration than to adopt children of different races? Of course, this was not just a publicity stunt, since both Jim and Marceline wanted children. Due to Marceline's health problems, she would have difficult pregnancies even if she could carry a baby to term. To begin their rainbow family, they decided to adopt a Korean child, two actually, who had been orphaned. They renamed the four-year-old girl Stephanie and the two-year-old boy they renamed Luke. Their new adoptive parents and the congregation adored them, but Lynetta was not so welcoming because she did not like kids. At about the same time, Marceline found out she was pregnant. Although the pregnancy was difficult and uncomfortable, she used her training as a nurse to take care of herself. Coming closer to term, she got lots of bed rest. Temple women helped care for Agnes, Lou, and Stephanie. In May 1959, Jones arranged a trip to the Cincinnati Zoo. The group included his children, but not Marceline, because she was in the final weeks of her pregnancy. On the way home, Stephanie rode with a congregant. Unfortunately, a drunk driver hit them, and she died instantly. Both Jim and Marceline were devastated. As if that wasn't bad enough, because the little girl was Korean, no Indianapolis cemetery would bury her next to white people. Eventually, her body was prepared by a black mortician and she was laid to rest in a black section of the cemetery. That just isn't right. Three weeks after Stephanie died, Marceline gave birth to a boy who they named Stephen with an A.N. in honor of Stephanie. Marceline only claimed to have a vision once, and that was on the night her daughter died. She said that she had fallen asleep, only to be awakened by Stephanie outside on the porch. According to Marceline, Stephanie said, Oboke needs a mommy and daddy. After the funeral and Stephen's birth, the Jones contacted the orphanage where they had adopted Stephanie. It turned out that Stephanie had a six-year-old sister 
named Abuki, whom the Joneses adopted and renamed Suzanne. The nature of Marceline's vision can be debated. For instance, it could have been a grief reaction and she honestly believed it, or it could have been a lie told so many times that she came to believe it. In 1961, Jim and Marceline booked Indiana tradition and adopted a black infant that they named James Warren Jones Jr. Well, friends, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button, press the subscribe button, and if you want to know when I come out with new content, hit the, the bell next to the button. My Twitter, Discord, email, and PayPal links are in the description, along with the source that I used for this episode. The best way to get in contact with me is Twitter, followed by email. Please leave comments in the comment section. Not only do I love hearing from you, but it also triggers the YouTube algorithm. Keep learning and searching for truth. Here are a few videos from my library. If you have not watched them yet, go ahead and watch them and tell me what you think. Until next time, friends, stay safe and goodbye.